Good morning, everybody. Uh, that session is recorded. Um, I want to welcome you. I'm, uh, I welcome you. I'm Alex, sales director at uh, ID. You probably worked it out already. I have a little bit of a cold. I uh, hope you'll understand me well. Um, we spent three days at the National IT Security Conference in Germany, known, uh, known as uh, ITSA. Um, and you may not be familiar with it. It happens in Nuremberg. Um, it's known as the home of IT security, and it's been a good success this year. Um, a lot of people are still nervous with COVID and, and uh, how we can all get infected again. Yet uh, 700 exhibitors participated, around 15,000 uh, visitors, and we as an exhibitor have been very successful. Um, I was lucky to uh, get one of these speaking slots uh, where I presented to you, uh, clients or partners, uh, over a 15-minute period. Why, in English, um, the fact that multi-factor authentication can um, um, protect your business is somewhat of a market lie, Some, something that we as an in industry have, have been slightly misleading about. And I explained that and I will uh, give you a rundown of that information in the next few minutes. The context for that is, is really this one. Um, uh, I, I'm 46 years old. Um, when I started working, I was given one of these uh, smart cards and I was told to use a, a long password, which, which I did. And then my password was too ugly, it was not long enough, it was too short, it was not complex enough, there was something wrong. I had to reset it every 90 days. Then they gave me like a, like a, like a dongle to log in and so on and so forth. And that didn't really matter. If you look on the right at the curve of the uh, breaches, uh, it's only increasing. We know for a fact that uh, in 2020, the, uh, the World Economic Forum indicated that 81% of all of these breaches had a root cause and, and that was passwords. Um, we know in 21 from Verizon, that number increased to 84%. And we know from Cisco and many other sources that agree on this number that in 2020, that number is set to be around 90%. Around 90% of all the breaches start with phishing, start with your password and your credentials being compromised. What's also interesting, and uh, you may not know this, um, is that Phishing is the root cause of, of, of phishing, obviously, um, but it's also a, a very important factor for ransomware, as the uh, propagation of ransomware will more often than not make use of phish credentials to propagate. Uh, that's a case of seven out of 10 ransomware. These are my contact details. Uh, you're welcome to call me. You're welcome to uh, email uh, me. Um, my email address is alex at getid.de uh, 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 here. And um, like I said, you're welcome to send me an email if you want to um, go deeper in that conversation or address your particular project. So um, what we addressed at the conference, and, and like I said, the echo was very, very good. I think we were uh, on the dollar. Is MFA the silver bullet? Really, is it really a civil bullet as far as IT security is concerned? Is it right for you to go on LinkedIn, to go on, on uh, social media, to go on, on uh, journalistic sources, on all these websites that will give you expert advice, and you'll be reading, oh, you know, that would have been avoided if MFA had been rolled out. Is this right? Let's start with the basics. Uh, deploying MFA for most of us is a challenge. So this is what we found, and we are an MFA vendor. Uh, this is not the point here. This is, this is not about what we do, but this is what customers and partners tell us. Time is a challenge. Most organizations, whether they are partners or clients, customers, public sector, private sector, it doesn't matter, don't have enough people. They don't have enough time, and they don't have enough resources to go around. Um, outsourcing or, or using managed service providers can be a solution in that respect. But then again, the same partners and the same managed services partners are also struggling for people and time. So there's a, a big time issue here. Second one, and this is 100% of, of the customers we spoke to, and no exception. Customers do not want to provide second devices. Point. They don't want to provide phones. They don't want to provide those USB keys. They don't want to start managing extra devices. This is just not something anybody we speak to wants to do. Option, ask for users to use their private devices. You can. Uh, in some markets, it's not allowed. In some others, it is. But you can always do that. And then 
you'll find that in a lot of markets, you'll have end user resistance. People will say, it's my private device. I will not use it for work purposes or uh, simply no, I, uh, I'm not willing to even uh, listen to your consideration here. This is my private life, stay out of it. And this is true uh, in Germany, it's true in France, it's true, it's true in North America, we see that a lot. Uh, the third point is legacy. Um, when you think about um, multi-factor authentication, it, it rests on a number of technical components, uh, and some of them are just simply not fit for uh, legacy multi-factor authentication or the MFA that you know what's available in the market. Um, the so-called modern authentication or passwordless authentication uh, simply won't fit uh, legacy apps, uh, legacy systems, anything that's held up or, or that has a username and a mask in the uh, a username and a password in the mask. And a lot of the customers will have some legacy apps and legacy systems. OK, uh, those were the challenges. Let's assume you've mitigated them. Let's assume that you have multi-factor authentication rolled out to all users. Obviously, some users is not going to solve it. Um, let's assume that you have uh, rolled it out to your entire user base. What does it mean? And there we got our partner from uh, Cyber Insurance uh, um, um, Group uh, to participate on stage with us and to give us their feeling about this. Uh, Robert could not join us on this call, but he shared with us the market situation. The claim ratio today is in excess of 100%. Let's make it uh, let's make it simple. We don't all, all work in insurance. They have a quasi certainty that a, a customer who's insured will be breached and will make a claim. And that for an insurance company is a very difficult and tense situation to work with. So those market conditions will uh, keep getting harder. And this is something that they're planning for. There's a shift on in focus from the insurance companies, um, and that shift of focus is on reducing customer risk. Uh, that's all to do with the quality of information security that they get. Uh, it's making sure that uh, customers, you perhaps, have deployed a, a minimum uh, IT security systems and procedures in place, and that uh, there are action plans in place to make sure that the insurance coverage is uh, is adequate. Now, let's think about the minimum requirements as far as the insurance companies think about it. Um, there's, there's a growing list. Uh, here we focus on multi-factor authentication in dark green, but as you can see, there's also off-site backups, awareness training, which is very important, by the way. This is not just all about phishing. Network segmentations, privileged access management, patch management, uh, EDR, so, so on and so forth. And you can start to measure the importance of having projects that are short and sweet to implement and to, and to administer because this is starting to be quite a long list of things that you have to do, um, especially if your IT security team is um, either growing or not quite uh, established yet. Now, this is where Shung Group comes in. Uh, they come with a partner network of attractive partners with you know, different uh, offers for different solutions to help you achieve that. Um, they have a competence center that is specialized in uh, information security um, and that will help you and them uh, come up with the right uh, coverage concept uh, and all of that with 24 by 7 support in the event of a crisis and information security uh, issue, which, as we learned uh, just a minute ago, is is a quasi certainty in, uh, in this day and age. Insurance uh, of a question I asked uh, the Schunk group on the on the on, on, on this uh, speaking slot was is any MFA MFA for the insurance company better than no MFA? The answer is is uh, kind of for now in 2022 is kind of like that, and I'm I'm one of these guys who think this is probably true, um, but this is not sustainable. It's not sustainable because MFA was not never developed to stop fishing. It's a tool that's developed uh, and is doing relatively well at uh, stopping brute force attacks. But once you've become the target of a phishing attack, it simply can't protect you. It's not designed for it. Don't take my word for it. Um, I'm, I'm merely a, a sales guy. Um, all these companies there on that slide had multi-factor authentication deployed and they have been breached. Some of them breached uh, through the actual multi-factor authentication they developed themselves. Um, and some of us breached uh, simply because their multi-factor authentication solution in, used, in use was performing as per design. And like I said, is not designed to stop phishing. Some companies here, banking, services, clothing, retail, online gaming, uh, software, uh, you know, the list is uh, getting longer every day. 
I don't have time to go through this in detail now. Just know that credential based MFA can be fished and can be done very, very easily. Um, please get in touch with me. We have a, a, a very experienced pre sales. We can explain to, uh, that to you in detail how it's done uh, and how somebody with relatively low skills, uh, probably of a very young age with no budget, can actually fish you. Uh, this is scary, but uh, uh, we can explain that to you in detail. Um, for the users, uh, and again, I, I kind of like think here about all those phishing awareness trainings and all these things that you buy for your, your users, and, and they are important, as I mentioned earlier, um, but it, it's very unlikely to uh, eradicate phishing. And, and the reason for that is because some of these phishing attacks are so professional. Um, this is a CIEM use case, so customer identity and access management, looking at how end users of um, a retail service like a bank uh, can be fished, and it's, it's just impossible for the users to know. So is, it, is this the fake authentication page, or is it the right one? Is this fake, or is it the right one? It's very, very hard, uh, very hard to know. And, and this is why um, we, we kind of think of phishing as something that needs to be, as far as we're concerned, as, as a company, it has to be prevented systematically 100% of the time, no matter what, because asking the users for their contribution or is, uh, is probably too, uh, too much of an ask. Let's come back to pushed-based uh, MFA. Is this better? No, it's, it's not better at all. Pushed-based MFA can be uh, very easily circumvented. And again, this is not something that needs to um, be executed by an engineer in some lab with some, you know, decades of experience that can be done by a teenager in his bedroom with uh, no equipment whatsoever. In fact, um, here, and this information is only a couple of weeks old, um, so from October, uh, November 2022, push and OTP are no longer safe. The US Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency has officially degraded push and OTP-based authentication. That's very important uh, because, as I mentioned uh, right at the start, we as an industry speak about multi-factor authentication as something that would be like a silver bullet. And it's not. It's just a different method for authenticating that has, depending on the way it's applied, different results. Um, again, our pre-sales can explain that to you in great details, and we can probably give you some, uh, some uh, live, uh, live examples as well. Um, how does phishing via prompt bombing work? Um, I think that was the case of Uber, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> where somebody got prompted for authentication. They got a lot of pushers and eventually somebody reached out to them through social media on WhatsApp. I think it was saying, hey, I'm your admin. Will you please now approve one of these pushers so I can do what I need to do? And, and it happened. Um, it's not a way uh, today to protect yourselves. And you have to be conscious of this because most, if not all of the authenticator apps that you may be using, if you're lucky enough to have a smartphone, of course, for work, will be uh, making use of push-based uh, authentication. QR code-based MFA can also be fished. This is probably uh, um, one of the things that uh, you, you you know already. Uh, you go on a certain website, you'll display the QR code, uh, you'll be scanning it and the hacker will be using it, that's QR code uh, as well, to log in as you. Um, for a live example, uh, get in touch and our pre-sales can show that to you in, uh, in great details. What about more complexity, you wonder? Uh, here, I like Alexander a lot. I think a lot of his posts are very provocative. Uh, I like the style, uh, voice of LinkedIn. So I share that with you because it's likely that you'll have seen his profile and probably follow him already. And here the recommendation is more complexity. Shall we deploy conditional access everywhere? Is this something that we want to do? And actually, that theme here has been reused by a lot of, of different vendors. Vendors that provide uh, SSO vendors that provide multi-factor authentication solution, and they have different licensing plans with different options. And one of the more expensive options is to deploy risk-based authentication, adaptive authentication, context-based this, um, conditional access that. Um, it's always something that is presented as, as a possible solution to help us mitigate the risks of a poor MFA architecture. Is it really? The answer is no. We've been lucky enough to work with the UK's National Cyber Security Centre in the UK, um, where we have assessed the different authentication methods that are available to you and to, and to us in general, and we've ranked them. And we've ranked them on the basis of a risk profile that they present. Um, worse is password. Obviously, uh, uh, password-based security is, is no security. 
uh, all the way to what we provide, which is fish-proof multi-factor authentication using the WebAuthn standard with additional controls and additional methods that will give you prevention from all um, phishing, all uh, credential-based attacks, and obviously as well account takeovers. And then you have the latest and greatest coming from America uh, through that FIDO2 uh, alliance, and then you'll have the rest. So password less in the UX um, based authentication where you get a push or password plus a push, etc. Now, as you deploy complexity, context based this, conditional access, uh, etc., you're putting like a gate in front of the authentication. And what really happens is that your login is deemed as risky or meets a certain type of conditions that will prompt for multi-factor authentication. It doesn't mean or it doesn't change anything about the risk exposure uh, or your risk exposure as, as it relates to what multi-factor authentication solution you're using. It doesn't change your exposure in general. So this is something to, to remember um, that complexity doesn't solve the situation. It can be useful in some scenarios, but this is not going to make a legacy architecture like one of these uh, multi-factor authentication suddenly fish proof. This is just not going to happen. Um, in seven points, uh, what did we learn? Speaking to hundreds of people, I still have a poor voice after speaking so, to so many of you. Um, many, many, many customers do not understand phishing. Um, most, actually, we spoke to kind of associate phishing with working from home. There's that strange feeling that um, it's something to do with VPN, it's something to do with uh, remote desktop, virtual desktops, and that it's when you're not in the office that this happens. Um, very few of the same probably people kind of felt that if you're behind firewalls, if you have, if you're in the office and you have a firewall and your email security programs and and all these things running in the background and humming in a data center, you're safe. Um, and, and I found that actually staggering, but there was that overwhelming feeling that if you're in the office, you're all right. You know, it's OK. Um, nobody, literally nobody understood that you need to protect all users to achieve fish proof. Uh, it's 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 a, again a bit of a staggering uh, finding, but um, a lot of the clients we spoke to were under the impression that if you protect the uh, privileged users, admins, architects, etc. Then you, you're you're all right, and then you're protected, and that's obviously not true. What's going to happen is a secretary is going to get infected. She's going to click on a phishing email. She lose her credentials, and from there, all sorts of bad things can happen. Uh, phishing protection and protection in general uh, happens when you protect all users. Let's not forget here that phishing is root cause of this year, it seems 90% of all breaches. So it's really important that we acquire this concept that if you protect all users against phishing, you're reducing your risk by uh, perhaps up to 90%. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not sure that number is correct, but that seems logical to me. Um, very, very, very few uh, understand that multi-factor authentication is a method of having multi multiple factors of authentication to authenticate and not a result. And that means if you have a a USB key, you'll have a certain result. If you have a telephone, you'll have a, set, a set certain result. If you have a, a, a password and an OTP through a smartphone, you have a certain result. It's all based on the application that you have and the solution that you have implemented and how you've implemented it. Um, so really important. We recommend multi-factor authentication for all users using the web WebAuthn standard that, that we have implemented in our solution called uh, Authn, simply Authn. Um, and that's how you will approve, you will achieve fish proof of, uh, authentication for your organization. Uh, last finding is none, zero percent, <laughs> none uh, of the customers we spoke to um, wanted or think that adding second devices to their state is a good thing. Whether that's a smartphone, a USB key, a dongle, a smart card, it doesn't matter. None, zero point zero percent wanted to do that. And, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, if you have, I don't know, 100 users, you have 100 PCs to manage, 100 users to manage, uh, that's probably uh, quite enough already. Do you want that number to become 200 if you add smartphone, or USB keys, anything like that? The answer is probably not. And so leveraging multi-factor authentication that we use the uh, user's devices, PCs, Macs, fin clients, smart tablets, whatever they might be, as the authenticator is a real win 
That means you can achieve MFA without a second device. That was for all customers extremely important. That's the end of uh, my uh, return on experience. That's what we uh, found at ITSA. That's what we discussed at ITSA uh, over three days. Um, and I hope you found it useful. Um, if you're not in Germany uh, and you find that your market conditions are extremely different, I, I'd love to learn. My email address is alex at getid.de. Uh, uh, um, and if you found this webinar useful, please let me know. If you didn't find it useful, please let me know. I'm, uh, I'm very open for feedback. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye.